Good morning, everybody. Well done for waking up. It was a struggle for me. It was very close to not happening. Um, yeah, so today should be very fun. We have two speakers who will each be giving us a presentation before we start a panel discussion. So first up, we'll have Linnea, who will be speaking for about 20 minutes, and then Henning will be going for about 10, 15 minutes, I believe. And then we will move into a panel discussion, so kind of a debate. So yeah, get ready to be excited. Okie dokie, so first up we have Linnea. Uh, Linnea runs the Greener Events Foundation um, and has an active interest in sponsorship given that she spends a lot of her time every day dealing with this. Um, she brings a wealth of knowledge on the subject, so seeing as I don't, I shall let her speak. Thank you, Nadia. Okay, good morning, everyone. This is, oh, what happened? This is interesting. Okay, everyone's awake, I get to tell. <laughs> um, yeah, this is kind of interesting to speak to you in English while I know most of you in uh, my uh, mother tongue, Norwegian. But um, it's an interesting activity to do in the morning. My name is uh, Linnea Svensson. I'm the uh, executive director of the Greener Events Foundation, which works with sporting and cultural events to help them uh, make more sustainable uh, events. Uh, that means uh, economic uh, sustainability, it means environmental sustainability, and it means uh, social sustainability. So sponsorship and working with partnerships with uh, uh, companies are an important part of that. So a year ago, uh, I wrote the sponsorship handbook for the Norwegian uh, Live Association music organization. Norsk Concert uh, They used to be named the Norsk Rockforbund. Uh, it's still really in my brain. So this is a handbook helping uh, cultural events organizers to uh, work with sponsorship in a more uh, sustainable way and also giving them more knowledge. So uh, what is sponsorship? How many of you work with sponsorship as a part of your business? How many of you are cultural organizers or cultural events? Okay. How many of you are English speaking? Okay. Oh <laughs> okay, on this. <laughs> Native. <laughs> uh, good. So this is the definition that uh, we work from, and it's in Norwegian, so most of you can read it. But uh, it's uh, sponsorship involves two parts to be actually valid. And the one part is that you have a um, transaction between two parties, a sponsor and a sponsee, where you have different rights uh, um, transferred from the object to the sponsor. And uh, for those rights, uh, there is uh, a barter, uh, like services and goods, like an in-kind sponsorship, or it can also be um, and or money transferred. But the important part is that the sponsor also has to use their marketing um, uh, association rights in order to make this actually valid. So without the sponsor actually activating uh, these rights, it's not really a sponsorship. And if we go way back, we see in the history a lot of uh, mentors or messians or different philanthropists that actually give a lot of their um, um, wealth uh, and help uh, in social cases or in, in cultural cases like the Medici family that we know from the Renaissance, uh, which housed uh, Da Vinci, Michelangelo and so on. So they have had lots of artists and, and uh, cultural skills, but also uh, knowledge, right? So we see this house mesh it's a house full of uh, entrepreneurs and, uh, and uh, different kind of innovators. So those days and still we see the philanthropic part of, uh, of uh, giving gifts, like giving funds and giving uh, economic uh, different kinds of incentives to, um, um, for instance, cultural events. But sponsorship is something else, it's not <coughs> just getting the money, it's actually a marketing communication channel. Um, so it actually makes 
um, the sponsor having to think in a different way than just giving the money and think that that's it. And the same way for the sponsee, uh, they have to think about giving, uh, getting the money, not only as a gift, but actually as uh, uh, an interaction. So sponsorship gives more opportunities. Uh, it gives the brands exposure. It gives the brands the possibility to associate themselves with different values from the sponsee. It gives the possibility uh, to leverage their brand and also to activate with, it with their target group. So it's a very targeted uh, way of marketing the brand. But it's also a part of the experience economy, making experiences through the sponsor uh, and the uh, sponsee product uh, to give the target group something else, something different, and also to position the brand. Um, and also, it's a very targeted way to meet the audience on their home base, where they relax, where they have fun. And I guess a lot of the cultural events that we know, it's uh, some kind of leisure where people actually relax and are open in a different way than if they're just walking down the street looking at lots of advertising. Uh, and also, it's a mutual business development possibility, and I think that's one of the most in interesting parts of this. Um, so the Norwegian media market uh, also includes the sponsorship as a um, market communication channel. So we these are numbers from 2012, and the numbers from uh, 2013 are being released, and as you maybe uh, re read in the papers, the advertising market in the, in the printed press is really falling, right? So a lot of the, it, this doesn't mean that there's less advertising or marketing uh, money in, uh, in, in this um, part, but uh, it's just allocating in, in a different way. So this number, 4.6 billion krones, is actually decreasing. I think it's around uh, 2.6 or 3, or at least it's really falling. I'm not gonna tell you. The Internet is really growing. This is the um, it's a wrong number. It's about 3.1 billion, and you see that sponsor uh, sponsoring is actually uh, four billion krones in Norway, and about 75% uh, of that goes to football and other sports, and it's maybe four or five different um, sports that get most of this. So you have a lot of different sports that struggles uh, alongside the cultural event organizers. You see the festivals um, has about 350 million krones uh, a year. So it's a, um, as festivals are kind of the football in the cultural event uh, cycle, it, it, you can tell it's a really big uh, uh, difference. So the marketing mix, we're a part of that, and you know you know this, right? So it's price, place, promotion, and product. And sponsorship uh, is a part of the promotion P. So this means that uh, the marketing communication channels uh, is about advertising, sales promotion, personal selling, PR, direct marketing, and sponsorship is a part of the sales promotion uh, part. So it's just to know when you work with sponsorship what kind of system you're a part of. I, I think a lot of uh, cultural event organizers don't really understand that they're, they're actually fighting about the money from a lot of different channels, like the media agencies, for instance, and they don't know anything about sponsorship, really. I know that a lot of them has uh, started uh, um, beyond the advertising uh, parts of their uh, companies, but uh, it's still uh, not something they actually work for and it's because it's so complex and really hard to get. So are there any media agencies here today? No. Are there anyone working with the uh, media or? No. <laughs> so the, the two other speakers. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, so the stages in sponsorship really briefly is that you need to have your sponsor uh, strategy and your positioning uh, plan ahead. So you have to know where you are in the market, who are your competitors, what are they offering, what is the price. It's just the same as setting up any kind of company, really. But you have to know who you are as a sponsee, as what is your product. 
who is uh, who are you who is your target group if you don't know that it's really hard to sell kind of your rights to any kind of um, sponsor uh, what are you what is the right company for you to work with? It's not about calling any company. I guess you um, are from uh, Microsoft gets a lot of calls from different, uh, uh, um, different uh, com smaller companies and uh, who wants help. But it's, it's about not calling just anyone that you think is a good idea, but actually having a plan about it. Um, to know what kind of price you have to know the markets you have to kind of do some research about it you have to make like a wanted list who is who are the, the most interesting uh, companies for you to work with who's the right person to talk to because often you spend a lot of time talking to the wrong people right so you have to know exactly who can help you uh, with this and you have to know what you can offer uh, maybe the most important part so you do the phone call, you book the meeting, you uh, negotiate the, co uh, the contract, and uh, then you start actually doing uh, the leverage and the cooperation and actually um, make um, the cooperation happen. And of course, then you have to follow up to and evaluate the whole time. So to start with the, the identity part, this is a model... Uh that fits really well with the uh, music events. Um, but it's basically to evaluate who you are and what are your goals and what are the aspects of this that you really want to enhance. So uh, how you communicate, who is your audience, what's your music profile, the graphical profile, uh, what kind of vendors you use, the arena, uh, what kind of drinks and food profile you have, what kind of, uh, wha what's what's about the, the staff and the, and the volunteers? Uh, are they local? Are they from the whole country? Uh, where uh, are your events at? Is that something spectacular or just in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the city? So the sum of all of these parts actually tells who you are. And this kind of helps to explain yourself to the company that you will want to talk to. So building your ev uh, event identity and know your market position, know um, uh, and actually communicate and build your own brand uh, will help you to be a more interesting uh, sponsor object. Uh, and also working with finding the relevance and the fit with a sponsor uh, would actually uh, give it more rel relevant content. So model of this is um, the transferal of associations. This is between Statoil and uh, the Norwegian Football Association, where you see some of the, uh, the f um, areas that will actually connect this. It's both Norwegian, it's uh, uh, working with development, it's the future. And Statoil now also works with young talents, right? So that's kind of interconnected. But it's not about football or oil. That's kind of their core activities. But it's still uh, areas to find a fit. Right? So um, when you find a fit, it's important to understand how you as a sponsee can help a sponsor actually uh, succeed. And to understand that, you have to see how you can work to solve something for the target group. Uh, and you have to define the target group together with the sponsor. So if their target group can be uh, B2C or B2B, uh, business to business or, uh, or um, business to customers, or it can be employers, um, employees um, of them. So what you would like to build is a customer relation, right, with this target group. So um, uh, making sure you give some extra value that you uh, that you build trust, that you build ambassadors, those are really key uh, performance indicators. And uh, then you have to understand the motivation. You have to define the motivation for the um, company, and the company has to be clear on that also in, ma in order to make this actually be a successful corporation. So some motivation aspects, and these vary very much from 
company to company and corporation to compor uh, corporation. But these can be building brand awareness uh, or company awareness. If you change the logo and you want to expose the new one, for instance, then exposure is uh, an important channel in the, sp in the sponsorship um, uh, corporation. But building brand identity and association, uh, associating your values um, uh, is something different. And to shift your position in the market, that's about adding some different values maybe to your product or, uh, or to your brand. And also working and reaching some kind of target group could be a motivation. Um, building loyalty, for instance, and increasing sales. Um, but it's these things are kind of hard to, to uh, measure. And I, I think maybe Henning will uh, touch upon that a little bit later. But uh, social responsibility, for instance, is also uh, an aspect. And uh, then you're kind of balancing on the border to, to talking about gifts, not only uh, sponsorship. But often that's a part of the whole picture, right? So wanting to support something that you believe in uh, not only a marketing channel, right? So building social value, being a part of the local community, for instance, or supporting community that you find uh, interesting for you as a company, making co-creation and partnerships, that's something that's uh, a part of the sponsorship structure that I think cultural events really should work upon, not being only exposure uh, uh, channels. Okay, so this is about that companies and brands want to build a fan base as well, just as the artists that you provide or uh, um, the kind of stars that you have. Are you with me? Yeah, still awake almost? <laughs> Some of you are actually sleeping. I don't know, is this too boring? <laughs> um, so what can you actually offer a company that make, uh, makes your uh, event or your uh, project interesting enough? Uh, and it could be uh, giving naming rights. And we don't really see this that often in cultural events. It's more of us, um, or in Norway, we see it in sports. Um, but giving exclusivity, uh, brand exclusivity, is something that we see often. Logo exposure, of course. Um, Giving market communications possibilities like event marketing is something we see often. Doing PR, doing CSR cases, and customized marketing uh, opportunities. And also not forgetting the employees, the hospitality parts of customers um, in this. And also you have to understand what kind of hierarchy you would like. Uh, if you would like like a flat, um, uh, structure with different kinds of partnerships alongside different projects or if you want to build a hierarchy uh, with some larger sponsors and then um <coughs> and then uh, uh, smaller um, partnerships um, uh, it's kind of up to you uh, how you would like it but you have to think about it before you start working with this and then leverage is really really important and uh, these, um, um, this is often a bit of a, a misunderstanding in Norwegian because leverage is activating and activation is activisering. And we kind of uh, mix up these words and it's kind of two different things because leverage is where the sponsor use the communication channels uh, to make the sponsor uh, corporation known and um, using different kinds of uh, communication channels to promote this uh, sponsorship, that, that really makes the most sense, right? So if you use PR, if you use um, board campaigns uh, or internet uh, activation, social media uh, to build around this, and then you activ uh, activate in these kinds of channels, uh, that's when you actually uh, reach your goal in the best way. <coughs> and to get, uh, uh, to set up the best concepts for this, you need really, really clear goals, and you use uh, have to have defined activities for the different target groups that you have identified, and then you use the communication channels to build on this. Okay, so I'm going to give you some examples about how you c 
create fit or where you actually find really direct fit and sponsorships. So one case uh, that several of people here know uh, quite a lot about is uh, how Aya Festival and Hafslund work together on taking out all of the diesel generators and putting in electricity <coughs> uh, from the grid to the medieval park where the festival was at. And um, also working with um, different communication channels like PR, using uh, their electric cars, uh, building their brand uh, knowledge, but also making associations to a more positive uh, feeling uh, to the customers, not only uh, getting their bill in the uh, mail every day. So it was about activating their employees because they had a good time advising the customers face-to-face uh, -face at the festival in a positive area. But it also saved 80% uh, of uh, exhaust and pollution. So that was a really good uh, thing as well. And you see Vinyrock and then uh, the Norwegian uh, Tourist Association, they don't work together about money, but it's about content and creating content for the audience. So that's uh, another way of working. Uh, Union Sene and Comfort Hotel in uh, Drammen, they work with uh, tickets uh, to, and that increased uh, the number of nights uh, sold, but also number of tickets sold. So that was a business development case. Uh, Hove and uh, Statens Veivesen, they work together on um, the seatbelt campaign. It's a really young uh, uh, target audience and they're right in the middle of that campaign and they could in a fun environment actually build on this. And you have Volvo and the Norwegian Opera and Ballet, uh, which both are iconic uh, design elements in Scandinavia. They're both very interested in that and it's about supporting uh, supporting something that uh, they think is fantastic. Um, and uh, Volvo has 200,000 cars in Norway, so working with like the, uh, the main, uh, for them, main cultural event is really important. Okay, so I'm just gonna jump because, um, so evaluating um, and measure what, s what you can measure and make uh, audience uh, evaluations are really, really important so you can uh, know more about who's actually visiting, uh, visiting you. Uh, and this gives more uh, back to the, the sponsor. But also the success, success criterion is to find the relevance of the corporation, to find the business development case, to leverage, and to put in enough resources to follow up. So these are some of the main things you have to think of. And events is about making great experiences for others, right? So that's the most important thing as well. Thank you. So up next we have Henning, who set up Haya di Sonvinner. That's how bad my Norwegian is. Um, he set it up in 2009 and he's worked with sponsorship for the past 13 years. Um, and he's going to speak with us today about return on investment. Ish, yeah. Um, I have like 10 minutes to speak about return on investment in, in sponsorship, uh, which is quite a uh, huge area. And um, it all depends on if you're a property or a sponsor and in what category and such. So, so I'll, I'll be brief and, and leave room for questions and the, and the, and the panel discussion. Um, I come from Haya Dizemvinden, which is uh, part of a media agency now. Um, but it's, uh, it's a sponsorship agency working 50-50 with sponsors and, and properties, sponsor um, helping them with strategy, sales, acquisition, and um, um, activation and consulting them. Uh, <coughs> when it comes to um, return on investment in in sponsorships, it's difficult because there's no established currency when it comes to sponsorships, and there's several models uh, um, that you can use to either uh, 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 evaluate a sponsorship or evaluate your uh, activities, uh, but none of them are standardized so so it's difficult to give you like a clean-cut answer uh, on that but 
most of them when it comes to either setting a price or checking your ROI. Um, uh, devils with uh, two variables, which is tangibles, which are like the hard cash parts of your agreements, like tickets, uh, the commercial space you provide, uh, signage, mail outs, um, social media activities, anything you can sort of quantify and give a value to because there's, uh, there's a media value uh, in the market you can use. Uh, <laughs> but also, and probably one of the key points of, of sponsorships, you have the intangibles, which are like the brand preference of, for instance, AIA Festival. Uh, the love between their audience and AIA uh, has a value, but it's very difficult to um, um, yeah, put a number behind and competitor advantage, uh, like industry exclusive exclusivity, which is wrong, but yeah. Uh, which is, it's um, something that gives you leverage and, and gives you value, but it's very, very difficult to set a number behind. So we work, when we work with um, either sponsors or uh, properties, we, we it's all names and such, but we usually work mostly with return on uh, objectives. And instead of focusing on the sponsorship package and uh, what that is worth, uh, we, we try to uh, identify the possibilities. What can, what can we achieve together? Like uh, the Hofslund case, which is not numbers, but it's, it's a story of how can we make a uh, festival greener and um, and this <laughs> English in the morning, um, I had a project manager translate that, and it's not like top notch, but uh, it's uh, <laughs> it's sort of our work flow plan model for helping sponsors and uh, properties um, develop a plan, and also like a landscape uh, uh, in English. Huh? Yeah, what, yeah, accounting. Um, um, so that you can set a value to either a sponsorship or um, get some numbers regarding how you, um, what you've achieved. Um, so what we do is, when it comes to fit, we look at uh, target groups um, um, and target audiences. Uh, who are they? Are they the right ones? The population, how many do we, are we able to meet and have a dialogue with either on site at the event or through channels like social media or, or marketing. Brand preference, which is difficult to uh, put a number on, but how, how much love is there between the property uh, and the audience? And then um, is it in the right period of the year, do we have products uh, that fits this and, and value uh, match or body blah blah? Yeah, uh, which is semi important. But if there's loads of stuff there that you know you can take off and this is right, then you, we go on to like needs. What, what do the sponsor need? Where's their pain points? Um, and also, what can the property deliver on? Uh, is it branding? Is it sales? Is, is it corporate culture? Is it business to business? Uh, you can't do everything at once, and as if you're like a small event or a property, you, you shouldn't try to sell everything at once, but focus on some small, like, uh, key goals. Um, and when that is ticked off, we look at, like, the numbers um, and the budget and resources and such. If it's sales, what you want to sell sell, uh, how many corners are you willing to put in per sale, uh, and what timeline. And sales are like a hard currency and easy to, to measure. But if it's um, like corporate culture or uh, branding and such, it, it's, it's a bit more difficult, but we try to set a number uh, behind every uh, element. Um, and when all that is done, we, we sort of have the foundation of the sponsorship. And then we start working creatively with those like goals 
uh, and those resources and budgets and time frames how how do we achieve this um, in the best possible way is it through like mass communication PR um, co-marketing cross-marketing with other uh, partners is it like stand on-site experiences uh, social media digital and we build a plan and then we um, execute and then we track uh, that plan and the activation based on the like goals we set so it's more about what can we achieve together and putting a number behind that and seeing if you end up either above or below so that was super fast and uh, uh, not too many numbers but um, uh, ask me anything and I'll try to answer it uh, on a case-to-case -case basis which is easier cool 10-ish minutes okay so first of all Linnea why do you think it's so difficult for to get sponsors for creative initiatives for instance like creative mornings is it related to do you think government funding or is it a lack of a lack of know-how in the area maybe it's because we're too unserious uh, over here um, I think it's because um, you haven't built your brand enough yet with the creative mornings it's not known uh, it's not uh, you haven't built uh, your reputation maybe so I guess a business would be a bit skeptical of uh, endorsing you with money without really knowing what this is. And maybe the target group is not communicated uh, uh, openly enough. I don't really know how you do this, but uh, maybe you don't talk to the right person in the company or the objectives are not clear enough. But if you can see that, like until the <coughs> 70s, you saw a lot of the uh, philanthropists in the Norwegian society actually supporting different uh, uh, um, different uh, cultural events, for instance, with money. But when uh, w Norway found oil, the state came in and took a much more uh, active role in supporting uh, the social uh, aspects of our society, but also the cultural uh, parts of the society. So I think it's maybe uh, an um, development which we, because of the political climate right now, might see a change in. Uh, so it's about being going from the Medici way of thinking until having the state taking care of everything. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, and then in what way, Henning, I think I want to ask you this one, in what way would you like um, future cultural sp sponsorships um, to be handled by Norwegian corporations? Um, that's a difficult question, but uh, it's uh, when it comes to sponsorships, uh, as you maybe mentioned. But Norway is a very immature market, so so it's uh, we're years behind um, places like um, the states and even Sweden. Um, um, so it will just take time, I think, um, and it's not the just the cultural uh, events that are um, not used to dealing with sponsorships properly B uh, it's also the the brands and the companies so if you're out there you shouldn't be too like concerned with your lack of knowledge um, and sometimes you can use that as a benefit just being sort of naive and we have a good idea and you want to be a part of that and another important thing is even though you do everything Linnea said uh, half of sponsorship sales is like hard work <laughs> you need to call 10 20 50 companies and talk to them for a while and then you land something so it's uh, you can do all the preparation you you want but then you have like four miles to go so good luck <laughs> thanks and then Arif I want to move over to you um, and kind of yeah kind of look from the other side so what do you feel are the key benefits as someone who does sponsor events that may come from collaborating with creatives? 
Yeah, I'm the corporate guy here. Um, it's a tough question. Um, you know, uh, as I said, I'm not a sponsorship uh, expert or anything, but working Microsoft, of course, I, as Nina said, a lot of people called me and my colleagues just to, to like, uh, let's do, do you want to help us? Do you want to do this? In some cases, yeah, we have to look at, I mean, again, <laughs> for me, it, it depends who I'm talking to, what they're representing, um, but also trying to, 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 to do it this way that makes sense for us. And not just about selling products, but also a good fit uh, with us. Uh, can we work together? Because sometimes it might look weird. Like, why are you sponsoring this? Because of your logo or something? I don't like that. So, so as a person, uh, I'm not the sponsorship uh, expert again, but my different kind of people do different stuff in, in, in our company. But I would say that uh, if we find the right match, it, it, it's really good. It works. But it's hard to do it that, that way. It's not that easy. And by the way, we don't have a big bag of money or something that we can just pour our money at everybody. That's just so you know that. <laughs> I don't know if you didn't know that, but uh, now you know. Okay, and then over to Gauta, who I hope I'm not massacring your name. I really do. Um, <laughs> and I want to ask, what do you think is the strongest um, motivation for corporations that sponsor Cultural Life? Why do you think that they do it? Well, of course, it's the association. Um, and there's there has to be a fit like uh, Linnea touched uh, touch into. Uh, but I also think that a modern company is looking for um, a possibility to, to cooperate with the uh, first movers uh, who know what they're doing, they're first in everything, and see, well, there is a potential for actually, actually for funny innovations. And innovations can be small or big, but a modern company needs to to look for sponsored objects that um, they can be small, it doesn't have to be a festival or whatever, but with creative people they can work with over time. Because a good collaboration uh, can create new innovations and that should be a motivation as well. Yeah, really good, thanks. And then Arif, I'm gonna go straight back to you actually. I'm going to ask, in terms of someone looking for a long-term collaboration for sponsorship, what are the, the main factors that you would look for for working with someone in that way? Uh, first and foremost, that they're actually interested in what we're doing. Uh, not just coming because of the money or that they know that the company is Microsoft and Bill Gates can pay for everything, but actually know the company, understand who we are, uh, and be willing to work long, lo long term. Uh, I think uh, basically somebody who comes just to get some money as an investment, as you said, uh, just to get the company running and then that's it, right? That that doesn't work for us or for me. So it's the long term, which is basically what happened here with Mesh. It's been a long term stuff. And uh, it's it's uh, working because they are willing to do more than just you know doing the sales pitch and then going uh, half year after you don't hear anything. From that's not the case here. So I don't know if that's uh, yeah, that's okay. that's that's a really good point to follow up with whoever is sponsoring because they are paying the money. Um, and then, Henning, I'm going to go over to you and ask, there is um, a lot of sponsorship in the sporting world, and um, I feel as though in sports it does seem a lot easier to secure funding um, yeah, for sponsorship. Why do you think this is compared to cultural events, for instance? Uh, uh Mostly because that's just the way it is, uh, and because there's a history there, um, and the numbers uh, Linnea uh, presented are similar in Sweden or the States or the world. Like sports has around 70% of uh, the sponsorship market, um, because they, mm, when it comes to modern sponsoring, they were the first ones out there uh, with uh, televised events and such. Um, so it's 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 like uh, it's just easier for sponsors, uh, and especially in Norway, we're a, we're a nation of people who should be out skiing like every second day. Uh, we shouldn't be out drinking and at festivals and such. So 
um, that's just the way it is. So so it's uh, it's easier. But um, when you when it comes to growth, uh, like festival and culture and so such are are growing like faster than, for instance, football. So so uh, um, there's uh, a light at the end of the tunnel, um, and also because sports are media driven. Uh, like big sports at least when you when you have a football game on TV and you have fi 500,000 uh, viewers on television and such that that will up the price so yeah same question kind of um, over to Linnea <laughs> Very eager here. Well, uh, it's only actually four to five different sports associations that get most of these uh, th these funds. And we saw in the, in the cake diagram that 36% of the sponsorships uh, goes to the f uh, football association. And they've grown, in 10 years, they've grown from 80 million to 1.6 billion crones. So it's something about the rights and how they communicate it. But uh, it's also about exposure in media channels. Um, which is something they give uh, a sponsor. And that's really hard for the cultural events or places like Mesh to give that kind of exposure. So you have to build partnerships and business development, like Gauta and RF said. So you have to think in a different way. And cultural events can't be competing with the sporting events because we don't have the same um, aspects or tools. Yeah, we don't have the same exposure. So then you have to think in a different way with the company and understanding, like Arif said, who are they and what can we help them uh, with and how can we enhance this towards the right target group. So it's a very pinpointed way of uh, working. Exactly. And kind of a follow-up from, from that question, if, if I can, actually. Um, to Arif, it's being said that, that nowadays people are... Well, corporations are no longer content with just having their logo on the program, as you mentioned earlier. Um, why is that and what is it that, that you now look for? Um, I, I think it's very hard for me to say on behalf of other companies, but, but when it comes to Microsoft, we um, are in some way brand-wise quite good. We're fifth most recognized brand, I think, now, so that's good value. So just, um, and, and that's, again, uh, it, it might be also that the people you talk with in different places in Microsoft, they don't, uh, not everybody works with the marketing or branding. Uh, they work with the CSR, they work with the technology, they work with the startups and stuff like that. So, so it's like company inside company, right? So for us, for me, it was important to not just be a logo, even though uh, Eudin and Anish wanted that because that looks nice, I think. Uh, well, it's fine, uh, but for me, it was mo mo most important that we were there to help people uh, and that people thought about as the helping company, not this company who just sucks money out of your pocket uh, in licenses <laughs> or something and ha crash every time, stuff like that. So it's it's different aspect from my part, but but maybe, I don't know other countries or what they think about brand, but logo for me is not uh, essential. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, <coughs> I think Arvi is very, very right about that because if you like, if you see sports profiles, they have they can have up to ten logos on them, which, which and those companies sponsoring this outreach isn't necessarily a fit. So if if you want to have full effect of a logo exposure, you have to own the outreach you're sponsoring. Okay, that's a really good point. And just a quick note that I will be opening the floor for questions in a couple minutes. So start thinking of some because I want some questions from the audience. Um, first of all, I want to ask Linnea, we'll start with, um, are there any things that you feel the, the corporate side can do better in, in sponsoring? Uh, yeah, uh, that's actually using the rights that they have bought and actually activating on them because um, I experience quite many times that we have made an, uh, um, quite extensive agreement but nothing really happens. Uh, because they don't have the resources to follow up, or um, they don't, they just do it as a kind of a marketing uh, campaign, and nothing, uh, nothing really um, works. So they, w it's about actually setting the right goals, 
and actually understanding how you can make a project or how you can make um, a program out of it that actually works with the target group and improves for the company and for the uh, sponsor object. Yeah. And then Arif, over to you again. Are there any things that you feel the creative side can do better? Is there anything that they that you think, oh, why aren't you just doing this? It would be amazing. Um, I, I agree with Lena because it's like anything else. Uh, you have to follow up on both sides. Uh, so it's also back again, uh, as I said, that uh, might it would it would be good to have help back again because some of the people who were helping sponsoring getting the sponsorship money, like me, I'm not working in marketing or like so. I I am wor doing this as like on a side job maybe, but it's important. So getting more help, how to actually activate those again? <laughs> it sounds weird, but I I, I think that's a case especially here in uh, here in Nash that maybe when we had um, somebody who handled it it's, it's good when it does doesn't ha get handled it's I, I can't really then go back again and say hey we need more money and they say what did you do with the last uh, I don't know actually I didn't use it right mm -hmm. so I agree with you. so basically it's both it's the two sides the same story kind mm -hmm. of thing mm. And then Gauta, back to you, in terms of what corporations can be doing better. Um, the, the same question as Linnea, how do you think they could be, they could be improving? Well, um, they have to understand um, who they're working with. And um, I mean, just from both sides, you need to, a, uh, someone who needs money or wants uh, to get sponsored needs to understand the brand's communication platform. They need to do better research before they approach them. It's not just sending out a presentation with, you get this and this and this, we have so many on Facebook, we have um, these, yeah. You have to understand who you're approaching, trying to find where is the fit, and then see what you can actually contribute with. Because it's, it's not always about getting just the logo exposure, it's actually creating something together and opening possibilities, which means that the objects need to, they need to, um, come up with the good ideas, um, they need to, um, I, when someone approaches me, I always ask, what ideas do you have? Which, uh, which haven't you used? Uh, if I sponsor someone, I want them to use that something, on something that makes the event or whatever better, and I think that's really important. Probably, because I worked in sales for years, and in a way it's a sale you're doing, and, and one thing people forget that you, even as a corporate like Microsoft, you're talking to a person. And you have to make this person um, succeed in what you're doing. So if you don't, then the person is, you lost that person as a sponsor, right? So I would say it's a, it's a secret, so you know that. But you have to make that sponsor succeed as well. <coughs> so that, that you understand them. That's a really good point. And does anybody have any questions? Yes? Yes, um, actually I started with Mesh uh, uh, when it was very young, <laughs> it's still young, but when it they only had one floor and uh, I didn't was running around, the uh, only guy in Anders. So I remember my first one of my colleagues actually declined the request while I went in and, and uh, thought it was a very good idea to do it. And actually th that was uh, because I didn't was very good at following up and uh, we did something amazing. We have a lot of good events that then went, went out globally, that people heard about globally. Um, so it was success in events and what we did together, created another picture than we had before. So um, internally, that gave me and my manager a, a good kind of feedback. And people are actually now today use MASH from other parts of Microsoft now. So, um, so that's probably, a it's not, I can't put any money in it. I would like to say it's uh, how many co quantity is wise, but I think uh, it, was, um, it was a positive thing for us from CSR, from startup perspective, and also internally that people s understood that we actually are doing something good for not just selling product, but doing something more than that. It's a good thing for employees internally to have that feeling, yeah, mm -hmm. internal satisfaction, if you can say so. Yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? Yep. Wow. I guess uh, just understanding the time frame here, that it takes really a long time to building those relationships um, that Henning was talking about as well. But also how sometimes if it's a good enough idea, how quick things can go. But the biggest learning point is maybe to what RF is saying about understanding the company, what they're up to and understanding how you can help them and at the same time understanding how this can make the event much better for the target group. Uh, when you do that, uh, you succeed. And you also have to set really clear goals on who are your target groups. Like you said now, it's actually not only the mesh people, but actually internally that you can use it to activate. And then understanding that you can build activities <laughs> around that. So it's really complex, but uh, it's um, it's also very fruitful, and it's really important to um, to understand the company side when you work at the property, uh, for instance. So, good research is super important, for instance. Yeah. Thanks. And I have a question actually to the the whole the whole floor now. Um, well, for, for you guys anyway. Um, I'm wondering if you guys have a checklist that you work towards. So are there certain factors that you think in getting a sponsor? Are there certain things you look for in sponsoring an event? Are there certain things you look for? Well, um, it's partly always about creating some awareness of what you do. Um, it's also... Um, yeah, we're always checking what we've done before and how to work with other sponsors. And of course, it's about who else is sponsoring the event. And everyone has to pull in the si same direction to get the event or whatever better. Uh, a checklist mm -hmm. regarding... Um, so yeah, just kind of some, um, some guaranteed we need this in order to be able to work with these people. Yeah, we have several difficulties because we work with both sponsored properties yeah. and, and sponsors and such but we have several checklists um, when it comes to um, when we're out there selling sponsorships on behalf of a festival and such uh, we, we use that model and we spend loads of time we like to just create a good idea uh, that will help the sponsor succeed in a way and and uh, the property or the festival or the event or something is just at the basis, sort of. So like um, the Hove case in Scotland and it's uh, they would like to ensure that the 18 year olds don't die in traffic. So we made that campaign for them and the the, the su life. yeah I, I know <laughs> but that's why I, I just. Uh, <laughs> I wish I remember remembered, but uh, and then <coughs> Hov, it was just the placement and and the arena where you could meet eighteen year olds at their own like venue in a in a happy go lucky uh, mode instead of at three o'clock uh, on a Friday at school where you just want to go home. So, yeah. Okay, awesome. That saved lives. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Linnea, Alif, would you like to chime in on this? Oh. I uh, always work a lot with the event or the uh, property identity uh, to find kind of the strengths and from there go out and look for the right matches and fits uh, of companies that actually can enhance some of the areas where we want to be stronger uh, and to either create a fit from there or to to that there is actually a fit. That's how I search for the right companies. And then the activation kind of comes from itself. You can do the creative uh, uh, works from there. Uh, but so that means that I do a lot of research and don't contact so many companies, but I spend a lot of time 
pinpointing kind of the right ones and and uh, in that way I can make the agreements bigger than just um, but it takes time so that works so and then Arif I actually have a different question for you good point thank you and then besides funding are there things that you feel that events that you sponsor could take from you guys as a company that they don't necessarily know to ask for? Um, it depends on what kind of event. Um, I, I, as again, it's, uh, we have to try to figure out how we can again help when it comes to volunteering or doing something for the um, community as I said CSR wise. Uh, there is, I mean, we're doing uh, things with uh, that don't necessarily involve funds. Is uh, employees helping, uh, uh, going out to Red Cross, or I'm I'm doing like uh, stuff for um, for entrepreneurial uh, schools for young children, telling them about technology. So I'm not just not just about funds, but we also using our time, uh, which we have a lot of, in my opinion, a lot of smart people in Microsoft and they can use uh, in these things. So I don't know if you, you are asking about that, um, but uh, yeah, that's besides funds, basically, what we do. Um, I don't know if there is anything else we can do, but you are the experts here, so let me know if you have an idea. <laughs> okay, and I'm gonna go back to the audience to see if we have any final questions. Uh, yep. I think the the best way is w is w the way that suits you the best, w what you're most comfortable with, um, and that's back to sales. Some some people like to send an email, presenting the idea, and then calling them, talking about that. Uh, other people are more comfortable calling first and just having a discussion, and then uh, doing. Um, preparing uh, a presentation and such um, but like uh, um, some quick tips when it comes to finding a sponsor is um, using uh, the people around you and, and people you know to get um, into companies where you uh, normally would like need closed doors it's all about knowing people and networking and such to to get ahead uh, and also what we tell smaller events is Think of like the 30, 40 sponsors you would like to, to have and then write them down and hang it up on the wall and never call them because everyone else will. So, so look below like the waterline and, and don't call Microsoft and Statoil and Telenor and Hydro or uh, the big companies, but call the 400 companies below that with the same amount of money that get, get like a tenth of the calls. But the main thing is to actually book a meeting, either on phone or in person. So you can meet with a person, they have set a time for you, and they have time to listen to your case. And you have to be prepared, of course. Like Arif, Arif says, you have to know the company, understand them, and ask the right questions. And then uh, I would always send like a presentation in front, like just explain your uh, property. So, and you can talk about it in the meeting, but the meeting should be about the company and how you can help them, not about you. And I think a lot of people selling properties spend a lot of time just talking about themselves, not getting really to the point. Uh, and then after, I would uh, send a presentation where I explain some of the ideas that I've gotten from talking to them in the meeting. So you actually explain and show how you can actually activate the brand at uh, your um, uh, uh, arena. Yep. Um, yeah. Just one thing is, again, <laughs> I agree. Uh, the thing is that, again, when you come to, um, if you have, if you come to a meeting, uh, like to for me, I am not an expert on marketing or branding or anything like that. So if you start talking about those things, I'm just going to like sit there and look at you. 
So uh, maybe you should know who you're talking to as well. What is my kind of, again, success criteria? That's harder, I know, but if you know me, you probably know that. Uh, so I think that's a tip from, from me. I think that was a brilliant question and yeah, really, really good answers. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Gauta, do you have a response to that or are you just holding a microphone? Okie dokie. <laughs> Okay, so that ab about wraps it up. If we don't have one final question, anyone feeling daring? No, everyone's still asleep. It's the morning. Okay, so that's going to wrap it up. I want to thank again our panel for the day and give them a round of applause, please. <laughs>